son of Neil and Beth Newman. Aniston Troutman, daughter of Seth and Jerry Ann Troutman. Corey Davenport, son of Craig Davenport and Jessica Settle. Alexis Latham, daughter of Jim and Jessica Latham. Emma Lim Combs, daughter of Shannon and Becky Combs. Emma Claire McWhorter, daughter of Sarah and Brad Devine and Jeff McWhorter. Connor Combs, son of Shannon and Becky Combs. May be seated. Oh, you are seated. Okay. <laughs> this is a good morning, isn't it? Amen. Especially for these kids and their parents, and uh, it's always an ex graduation is always an exciting time for the graduates and and to uh, the families of the graduates. Um, we have a great bunch of kids here at Dubois Chapel, and and it humbles me when I think of them and. Uh, not only who they are today, but what, who they will be years from now because they have trusted the living God for their Savior. They've been brought up in a Bible-believing church. Thank God for that, you know, because not all churches so-called are Bible-believing churches. But I'm thankful, kids, and you ought to cherish that and you will all the days of your life that God placed you here where godly people have help shape and mold uh, your life into who you are and it will continue to follow you whether you go to church somewhere else or you remain here uh, but wherever you go in life this what you have been taught will follow you not just what you've learned in the educational system out there uh, in the public but especially what you have learned here at, and been taught here not only in through the word of God but by godly examples that have uh, lived before you. I have a verse of scripture that I want to share with you. There's so much I would love to say today, but time will fail me. And, uh, uh, but I want to read a verse of scripture from the book of Esther, the book of Esther. Um, and it's verse 14 of chapter 4. It's very familiar to all of you, at least the last part of that verse is. Uh, the writer said, For if thou altogether, this is Mordecai speaking, holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise uh, to the Jews from another place. But if thou and thy father's house, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom? for such a time as this. And I may be old-fashioned and I may be different than a lot of preachers, but I just stand here today believing that the God of glory, a sovereign God, has raised you youngins up for such a time as this. If ever before in the society of this nation that the, the society needed godly examples, it's in the day that we live in. And this is what you're doing, Duval's Chapel. And this is what you godly parents are doing. You're not just wanting your children to make it and to prosper. But deep down somewhere in, in the mind of God, there is a purpose for the training that they get here far beyond just them, but for those around them and all that whom they may influence uh, in their life to come. Now, real quickly, I want to lay the format of this uh, scripture. They were, in, they were in Persian captivity, they being the Jews. Now, this Ahasuerus, the king, that, um, that had chosen Esther to be a bride and a queen, uh, was the grandson 
of Cyrus. And Cyrus was the king that gave Nehemiah the edict to go home to Israel after 70 years. And those of you that know your Bible, God's hand was all over these, these pagan kings. And, uh, and so what happened was this evil man called Haman rose up to destroy what Jews was left. Now, most of them had went home. But a fellow by the name of Mordecai and his family stayed on, and he had a position in the government. But um, there was about 50,000 Jews left in Persia at the time of Esther. Now, Haman meant to destroy all of the Jews that were left. So God rose up Esther for a time such as that to deliver his people. Now... I got three points I want to make real quick. And kids, I want you to get this. I think this is a lesson in life that if you'll carry it with you, that it'll benefit you all the days of your life. I want you to understand what the Jews had to learn over and over and over. And you will have to too. I do. Over and over, I've got to learn that my faith is not in the hands of a world of evil, but in the hands of the Almighty God. And I want you to understand that. There's not, everything in life is not going to be roses. I don't care what the prosperity preachers tell you. It's not going to be. There's going to be tough times and valleys and hardships. You know, even as you struggle to get through college or university or the rest of your uh, 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 school years here in the county. You're, but I want you to always go back to this fact in your Christian walk. That your fate is not in the hands of an evil world. This world will overcome you just by when you look at it and watch the media and see all the evils that's coming up on humanity, especially your generation, it could just be overwhelming. But remember this, that your fate, your future, who you are and who you will be is in the hands of an almighty God. Because many years ago, you placed your life in his hands. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to God. And I promise you on the authority of God's word is that he's going to take care of you. This is what the Jews had to learn. This is what Mordecai was teaching Esther. And Esther delivered, God delivered the people through uh, this little queen who was beautiful. And she was everything. And she was chosen by a king to be his bride. And so all of you today, you're not an Esther You're who you are. You're who God has made you and will make you. But you are the bride of Christ. And he has chosen you to be so. And you're pretty special in the eyes of God. The second point I want to make is a quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, "In in the mortal conflict, I'm sorry, in the moral conflict now raging around us, whosoever is on God's side is on the winning side and cannot lose. Remember that. If you are on God's side, regardless of how dim life may get or how circumstances may seem to want to teach you otherwise, if you are on God's side, you are on the winning side, and you cannot lose. But if you're on the other side, he goes on to say, you're on the losing side, and you cannot win. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But it's a truth that if you'll carry through life, it will benefit you greatly. If you're on the winning side, if you're on God's side, you're on the winning side. You cannot lose. And the third point I want to make, we are all capable of doing wrong. And this is Garyology, okay? We are all capable of doing wrong. But know this, when we do wrong to others, we're doing wrong to ourselves. Because God's taken notes, and he's not mocked, and vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. No matter how much in life you would want to do wrong to others because they have wronged you so much, when you do wrong to them, you're simply doing wrong to yourself. I love you guys. God bless you is my uh, my prayer. Um... One other thing that I don't have written down that, that uh, Esther had in her life that we all need in our life is a good role model, a good spiritual role model. Someone, a pastor, a deacon, 
a mom, a dad, a Sunday school teacher, an aunt, an, someone that has set the right biblical example before you. You look at their life, pattern and mold your, and shape your life after their life. It could be a Bible character, but it really needs to be someone that when life gets tough, you can call them up and say, hey, I need your help. Knowing that they will do their best to tell you the truth, that they love you enough to tell you the truth, even if the truth hurts. God bless you. I want to pray at this time with these kids. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come unto you. Lord, you're the only one that we have to come to at a time such as this, Lord. These kids need you, God. And, and Lord, I know, I know they're not perfect. I know they have flaws and they fall short. They are the sons of Adam. But, God, they try. And they've had good examples set before them and, uh, that have walked before them, God. And they've had the right teaching. And now, God, I pray that you take all of this and use it to their benefit, that you continue to shape and mold their lives, that they continue to learn, Lord, about life, Lord, by hearing the word of God and studying the word of God. God, that they stay strong in you and the power of your might as they wear the whole armor of God. Bless them, we pray. Wherever they go in life, I know they'll prosper as long as they look unto you, the author and finisher of their faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, the graduates will now give out roses to uh, whoever they choose to, just uh, as a way of thanking you, thanking you for uh, helping them get to the point today. shoulder 
shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be you raise me up okay now we have gifts we're gonna send them up one at a time we're gonna start with preschool Ryan <clears throat> Ryan finished up Carter Creek Christian Preschool. He likes to play games, run around, and get his hair wild. <laughs> he will attend Greenville Elementary in the fall, and he plans to be a scientist one day. And I should have announced, if anybody wants to take a picture in the middle, he can come down. Aniston. Aniston finished up Second Baptist Church Preschool. She likes playing with her brother and sister, playing dolls and Barbies and gymnastics. She will attend Bremen Elementary in the fall and hopes to be a ballerina in the future. Corey. Corey finished up Longest Elementary and be moving to middle school. He likes basketball and football. He hopes to play in the basketball in the NBA one day. Alexis, she'll be moving to high school in the fall. She likes crochet, kayaking, and fishing. She wants to be a veterinarian in the future. And we'll go to the seniors, Emma Combs. Emma enjoys playing the guitar, painting, and making coffee at Sip and Spin. She will attend Owensboro Community and Technical College in the fall. Plans to obtain an associate and fine arts degree and then transfer to Western Kentucky University. Our second Emma, Emma McWhorter. Her hobbies include fishing and online shopping. She will attend Madisonville Community College next year. She plans to finish her associate's degree next May and then enter the teaching program in the fall of 2023. And lastly, we do have college this year, Connor Combs. He graduated from Murray State University with a bachelor's degree in health and physical education. He plans to turn professional in golf this fall. <laughs> we, we do have uh, a few people who couldn't be here today. Uh, first is, what, this is in the program, Casey May Garrett. She's eighth grade, but she was not feeling well today. And we had Maddie Durrell. She'll be moving from elementary to middle school. And also uh, Blakeland Groves, who graduated from college. Let's give them all one last hand. All right, this time I ask the choir to please come up and we'll get our service started with singing and as the choir's coming up I'll ask our often ushers to please come and we'll take up the often this time and
Okay, Brother Kevin, would you pray all the offering?
I tried to think about um, the graduates as I picked our songs this morning, and I think Mom did the same. This um, idea not to, for, I don't know, to be confident in, in God's word, be confident in what you believe. Um, and that, I don't know, that's just such an important thing. I I have said this before, but um, I've seen the statistic that 50% of kids who grow up in the youth group at church leave their faith in, in their college years. And um, we really need to be praying for the graduates, and I just want to encourage them this morning to stay faithful faithful to what they believe, to stay faithful to the Word of God. So these are the songs that came to my heart this morning um, for, for them, but really for all of us. And the first one is Trust and Obey. I'd like to sing the first and the last verse of Trust and Obey. If y'all would stand and, and we can worship the Lord this morning.
While they're going to their seats, I said to somebody this morning, I said, well, you know, it's been 45 years since I've done that senior thing. And they said, uh, well, does it feel like it? 
Well, some days it does. <laughs> and some days it doesn't. Anyway, I want to quote scripture that's linked up with this song here. And it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Folks, if you'll keep your eyes on him, he'll be right there to take you through whatever. And I, I can, Patty and I can testify, our life has not been a bed of roses. I think the first six years we were married, she had at least one surgery every year. That's definitely not a bed of roses. But you know what? He was right there with us, and that's all that matters. Sometimes I let this old world have its way with me And there is no escape as far as I can see Captured by the wind that breaks so helplessly I know it There's never been a time when you weren't there for me. You are the calm at the center of my storm. When the cold winds blow, you're the fire that keeps me warm. When the soul Okay, good morning again. Yes. your heart, Kathy. God bless you, Kathy. Amen. We're thankful everything is well, as well as can be with that fractured arm. Amen. Good morning. God's good, isn't he? We praise the Lord for him, his goodness and mercy, and we're glad to be in the house of God 
And uh, I'm going to do my best not to keep you long. We've already had a good service with these kids and, and uh, the sing song service. And so we're just going to dig right in, all right? Let's give praise to the Word, and then we'll go from there. This is my Bible, the Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant, alive, powerful, preserved, sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word will never pass away. <clears throat> I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Give God a great big hand clap for his word. I want you to turn to John chapter 3. And you're not going to believe it, but the title of the message would be today, Jesus Christ the Centerpiece. Jesus Christ the Center. Mike, we must be on the same page. You know what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pray. If You know what? If you just follow the Spirit, you're going to be pretty close to one another in everything you do in life. So we're going to read John 3, 16, and then we're going to preach just a little bit. I pray that if there's anybody in this audience that's not saved that this would be the day that you would come and make your calling and election sure. The other night I went to a uh, award ceremony and uh, graduation for my grandson Bo and uh, my granddaughter Maddie gave her testimony and one thing that stood out to me in her testimony that when she came to conviction she was at a youth convention, a youth rally and the speaker said you cannot be rededicated. You cannot rededicate if you've never been saved. If you've never been saved. And you know, that, that is so true, isn't it? And she kept, her testimony was through life, she kept rededicating. She never felt good enough, kept rededicating. And finally it dawned on her, she had never been saved. Never been saved. So now she's saved. Isn't that wonderful? And, and sometimes, you know, that just happens. I don't know why it happens. Maybe we come to the Lord and make an attempt when we're young and then we wrestle with it for years before we finally get it right. And I want to say today, if you're in this audience and you've never been saved, I don't care what you claim in life, if you in your heart know and God has revealed to you that you've never been saved, somewhere in life, become a Christian, be saved according to the Word of God. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. John 3, 16, you know it. In the King James Version, it reads like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, in the house of God at Duval's Chapel, we beg your blessing upon this hour, upon your word today as we attempt to preach, God, upon this messenger. Help me to preach never for fame nor fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation to lost men. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Have you ever studied John 3.16? I'm sure you have. Every Baptist believes in it, right? Every Baptist believes in it. 25 words in this verse. 25. Guess which word is the centerpiece of the verse? Son. Son. 25 verse words. Son is the 13th verse in, the, in John 3.16. Now let me lay the ground for the message. Nicodemus was the man of the hour. Jesus Christ was actually the man of the hour. But there was a fellow named Nicodemus. He was believed, historians tell us, history tells us that he was the third richest man, one of the three richest men in all of Israel. He was a Pharisee. He was of the elite order of the Pharisees. He was a ruler in the synagogue. He was on the Sanhedrin council, if you will. He was not only of the 6,000 Pharisees in the land of Israel at this time. He had been, he had been numbered with the 71 man ruling council there in Jerusalem. And people, he was a role model. The, the families of Jerusalem would hope and pray that their sons would grow 
grow up to be like this man, be like this man. Now, now don't get me wrong. When we, I sometimes pretty, I'm pretty hard on the Pharisees. So was Jesus. But they wasn't all bad. They wasn't all bad, you know. And Nicodemus, I feel like from what I can glean from Scripture is that he was one of the better ones of this religious order. He was religious. He was he was uh, uh, rich. But he was wrong in what he believed in that day. The, actually, the transformation was taking place from the law into grace. And he was there. He was there. And the, this young preacher sprang up. And he come out of nowhere, just kind of stepped out of nowhere. <clears throat> he didn't go to the inner circle of religion. He was different than, than his peers. He taught as one that had authority, and his name was Jesus. All of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin knew him. They had talked of him. They wanted to understand him more. And he was just so different. They, didn't, they could not bring themselves to believe his teaching. But Nicodemus saw him just before this. If you back up in Scripture, Jesus had entered the temple. The, the, the people had made God's uh, temple of something, a den of thieves, Jesus called it. It was to be called a house of prayer, but they were there selling their goods. They were there uh, uh, desecrating the temple. And Jesus, this righteous son of God, comes in, turns the money changers' tables over. They were there to cheat the people and to gain uh, earthly gain. And he turns their tables over, takes a quart of whips, drives them and their animals from the temple. This got Nicodemus' attention. It wouldn't mine. It wouldn't, wouldn't it yours? It wouldn't it yours. If there was a, a church, and there is, in this county that was teaching heresy, if someone walked in, drove the, the people of that church out, declared that they were heretics, it would get my attention. I don't know of anybody that's, that, that's strong in their faith to do, this, do such, but Jesus was. Jesus was. That was God's house. That was the centerpiece of their society and their religion. It was the temple of God. It was where all of Israel would gather once a year to have church, if you will. And it was a special place to God, and it was very special to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he drove them out with the whip, and Nicodemus took notice. The Bible begins in chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and saith unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He was at the right place at the right time, wasn't he? This is what America needs. This is what churches needs is to get in the right place with God. The right place, I want to ask you, are you in the right place with God today? Are you? I know you're at church. I know you're here physically. Are you in the right place with God spiritually? Or have you just been going through the motions? This is what the law had become, Kevin. It's just a group of religious people going through the motions. The law was never intended to be that way. It was to bring people to God, to love the Lord. The law, and the, the law of Moses was given so that people could know their sin and know a righteous God by trusting him through the ceremonies of the law and the, and the religious worship of that day. But it had become just something that they did. Become traditional instead of spiritual and life-giving. And so when he saw this young preacher and the righteous indignation of God upon him there in the temple that day. He wanted so many times to walk into that temple and do what Jesus did, but he just did not have the authority. He just did not have the conviction. He just didn't have the faith to do it. Finally, God showed up. I'm going to preach a message one of these days. When God shows up, I'm going to preach, finally, God showed up. God showed up, and so it got his attention. And then that night, or some one night after that, he steps out into the darkness of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem night, and in the darkness of his life, he found the Savior. Where was it? I don't know. 
I don't know. It may have been in the Mount of Olives. It may have been in the garden. It may have been there in the temple court. I don't know where he found them, but he is always accessible, isn't he? You can find him today. You can, you can say, Brother Gary, you don't know what a mess my life's in. You don't know my Jesus and what he can do. He's in the business of straightening up lives, isn't he? Isn't he in the business of straightening, straightening up lives? And so this great ruler of the Jews found him, and he begins the conversation, and he said, Rabbi, teacher, master, and if you really study the word out of the Greek, it actually means doctor, doctor. He called him a doctor, a doctor, a doctor of, uh, 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 of theology, a doctor of the word of God. He knew he was somebody special. He'd not been. He knew that he had not been to the schools of higher learning there. He knew that he hadn't uh, accomplished a lot of things that would attribute to greatness, but he knew that he was somebody great, maybe a prophet. He said, we know that thou art a teacher, a schoolmaster, a rabbi sent from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, they'd seen miracles before. You know, I, I can't tell you this is uh, found in the Word of God, but I can tell you historically they taught that these rabbis, many of them were close enough to God that they could perform miracles, that God would bless them. We don't have all the miracles that God performed in the Bible. There was a lot of supernatural things that happened that was not put in holy writ. But people did it, was able to do those things because God was with them. God was with them. And so he said, you walked on the water, God had to be with you. You healed the eyes of the blind, God has to be with you. You raised the dead and, and caused the dumb to talk, God has to be with you. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. It's beyond my understanding how a lost world, a world that we live in, cannot see the light of the gospel. How that they cannot see that Jesus is everything and more that he claimed to be in the scriptures tells us that he is. You can't refute it. It's irrefutable. No one can. They can, they can uh, maybe refute history. And the woke people are doing that today, aren't they? They're wanting to do away with all of the history of this great or much of the history of this great nation. But I can tell you this, the life and times of Jesus Christ and him being the centerpiece of this earth and everything that we are is irrefutable. He was the, he is the son of God with power and great glory. Nicodemus recognized it. Muhlenberg County ought to recognize it. And the United States of America had better get back to him had better get back to him. Our founders believed it. Our founders said that we are endowed by our creator. Didn't he? Didn't they? They sure did. They believed him. Did you know Franklin was one of the most um, unreligious guys in all of the founding fathers? But Franklin believed when the Constitutional Congress couldn't get along and the Florida delegation got up and left and they were fussing and fighting, looked like a bunch of senators and representatives today. Franklin stood up and said, we got to have prayer. We got to have the word of God preached to us. I'm going to, I'm going to read you some of Franklin's uh, uh, quotes before it's before too long. And he said, this nation cannot rise from nothing without the hand of God being on it. If a sparrow cannot fall from the sky, Franklin said, without God knowing about it, how can a nation rise up without God's hand being on it? Well, guess what? A nation did raise up, and God's hand had been on it for 150 years, and then something happened. We started turning from God, knowing, knowing that he's real. Nicodemus knew he was real. He said, we know, but it was personal, really. I know that thou art a teacher come from God. 
Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't even wrap your mind around it. You can't understand it. I don't care how religious you are, Nicodemus, how much wealth you have, how, how, how schooled you are in the word of, did you know Nicodemus could quote the whole Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi? Did you know that? How in the world could anybody do that? They applied themselves and God gave them the ability to quote it. Pharisees, that was one of their, that was their board. That, they had to pass the board to become a Pharisee. And one of the questions on the board was, can you quote the whole Old Testament? And if they didn't quote it, they didn't become a Pharisee. Now I want you to get this. Nicodemus was a teacher. He had totally mean or disciples. They would follow him around. They would be tutored by him. They all grew up wanting to be like Nicodemus. It would be their, their uh, it's where they, the Hebrew word is hakna. It's where they got their hakna. Their power or their authority is from that rabbi. The rabbi was special. He was special. And these disciples of, of Nicodemus must have thanked God every day that they had such a man to be their rabbi. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus told, chose the disciples. He was still in the Jewish way of doing things. He chose 12 boys. They followed him around. He was their tutor. He was their mentor. He was their example. And he taught them the word of God. And so Jesus said, you can't even understand the kingdom of God until you're born again. Until you're born again. That's why my granddaughter Maddie had such a tough time through, what, 15 years of her life. She's 15 today. 15 years of her life because she tried to be a Christian, but she was never a Christian. She wanted to be like the pastor. She wanted to be like Grandpa or Grandma or Brother Woody or her mom or daddy or someone that was an example to her, but she couldn't be because she had missed first base, hadn't she? You got to be saved. You got to be born again. And I'm fearful that a lot of people go through this life having made a commitment to God, but had never been committed to God through the Holy Spirit. Now I'm telling you, what did he say? Why did he use the term born again? Because he was telling Nicodemus everything's got to change. Forget your old way. Forget, forget being able to quote the book of Leviticus. Some of you can't even find it in the Bible. It's truth, isn't it? I, I went a long time before I could find Nahum, but it was there. I finally found it, Mike. You know what I'm saying. We just don't study the Old Testament. Like, but he could quote it all. And God said, Jesus said, forget all of that. Forget your past. Forget everything you've been schooled and taught and all of that. Forget. You, you can't see the kingdom of God until there is a change that comes upon you by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. It is the only way you can understand this right here. I remember in Vietnam, the Gideons gave me a little New Testament, I believe Psalm. I wish I still had it. But... Uh, it really didn't mean a lot to me. I was so lost. But I remember trying to read it, and I didn't even know what the red letters meant. I didn't know I could turn to the front of it and would say the words of Jesus are in red. I didn't even know what they meant. I maybe asked someone. I don't know. But I couldn't see the kingdom of God because I was blinded to it all. And without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand it. You can't understand it. I can't understand how folks can lose loved ones, the love of their life, and continue in life without Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. We are it through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Except you be born again. You cannot see. Oh, he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born, born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. 
And then he tried to explain it. The wind bloweth where it listeneth, thou hearest the sound thereof. Can us not tell from whence it cameth or where it goes? So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. That's as good as it gets. Now, I'd be wasting my time to stand up here and try to explain to you how it is to be born again. I can't do it. He just said the wind comes. You see the trees blow. You see the leaves and the dust kick up. You don't know where it came from or where it goes. And I know the meteorologists today can tell you all the scientific part of it, but God knows. God did it. God sends the wind. It's God that does it. And you see the effects of it. I saw the effects of it before I was saved. I did. I started going to church. Let me tell you something. Those young people of this church ought to be sitting on these front rows. Who said amen? Thank you, Eldon. I'm going to try it again. Maybe i fish and get another one. The kids of this church ought to be hearing what goes on in this church. And I'm not talking about just the preaching. They ought to have heard that song by Mike. They ought, to, they, ought to, they ought to be people every once in a while get happy in the Lord and start shouting the praises of God. Whatever happened to the Spirit of God being upon our lives and in our lives? to the point we can't hold it and they see the effects of it. It tore me up, Ricky. It tore me up as a lost 22-year-old man sitting in the congregation when Lyndon Smith would get up and start kind of jumping up and down. I'm talking about a man that, I don't know how many, he was a huge man. He'd get happy in the Lord and testify of the goodness of God in his life and it would tear me up. I knew it was more than emotion. I knew it was something, and I found out later it was the Holy Spirit of God. We used to have baptizings on pond banks and riversides, and when they come up out of the water, they'd be shouting. I'm not talking about just old people. I'm talking about young people. Why? Because there had been witnesses before them that shouted the praises of God at their baptize. What if, what's, hap- what's wrong? What's wrong? God hasn't changed. We've changed. Well, I just like a real quiet church. Go down to Tucker's funeral home. It's quiet down there right now. Quiet. Things are dead, but it's quiet. So, my point about the kids is they ought to be where the power of God is and the Spirit of the Lord and witnessing people shouting the praises of God and testifying how God has brought me through this. Now, I talked to the kids and told them that, God, if you're on the winning side, you're always going to be a winner. But, boy, wouldn't that mean a whole lot more coming from you in a testimony like, like Kathy testified earlier? You say, well, it's just a fractured arm. It is to me, but to Kathy, it's painful, it hurts, and it could have been a lot worse. And I've had, I can say that because I've had two supracondyla fractures, and that's what she's got. Most common break in the human body, more than anyone else. It's just you fall, you catch yourself, it'll snap the end of that little bone, that humerus off right there. Sometimes it takes surgery, sometimes it don't. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but I've lived a long time. And you ought to learn things along the way, right? That's right. But it's God that sustains us. He is, should be the centerpiece of everything you do. And if you can't do it with God, don't do it. Don't do it. If God cannot be there with you, don't do it. We need to get back to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And so he said, so it is with everyone that is born Again, let me read a few verses. I'm going to try to sh- shut it down. If you're hearing loss, get saved. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? How can they be? Now I want you to get this. I-, I went back hundreds of times to that night in Israel. And there they are, the two teachers, one earthly, one spiritual. One who was a student of the Word, and the other one was the Word. 
And all of a sudden, instead of the conversation continuing, Nicodemus stops and starts taking notes. When he said, how can these things be? His understanding was so limited. And he's standing before the one that knows everything from the, from the beginning to the end. And Jesus said, art thou a master of Israel? Really? You can quote the whole Old Testament. You're teaching. You've got students following you around every day wanting to be just like you. And you understand not these things? If I have told you of earthly things and you understand not, how will you understand if I tell you of heavenly things? That's where we're separated, isn't it? That window, I, light comes through, but not enough to see what's on the outside, right? Some would call it an OPEC maybe. That's where we're at. We, we can't see everything plainly. That's where our faith comes in and we just have to trust the living God for what we can't see and understand. But he said, if I've told you of earthly things and you understand, how would you understand if I tell you of heavenly things? Boy, I get all those questions, Eldon. Well, we know each other in heaven. Yep. How? I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know Jesus said, we'll know even as we are known. I know that the disciples knew Elijah and Moses. They, they'd never seen them. They had been dead hundreds of years. And they knew God's got that all planned out. I don't have to know that. But what I have to know is that I'm born again, that I'm saved by grace, that my promise of being born again is eternal life in heaven. That's my promise that I hold to. Now, he said... If I told you of earthly things and you understand not, how would you understand if I tell you of heavenly things? And as Moses, we, we, he first of all said, we testify that which we have seen and, and teach that which we do know. If I've told you of heavenly, earthly things you don't understand, how would you understand if I tell you of heavenly things? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He takes him back to what he did know. Moses and the serpent. He understood that. He said it's going to happen again in a spiritual manner. Teaching of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he said for God so loved the world. I read it to you. And the center word in that 25 verse word verse is son. Son. He that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God, I don't care what you call yourself. Nicodemus was Mr. Everything to Israel. But to God, he was a lost soul that needed saving. Right? Doesn't matter what you accomplish in this world. If you die lost, you've lost everything. You've lost everything. Please, please, don't just get saved. Fall in love with the Savior. Fall in love. I'm telling you, I watch you folks. Y'all are crazy. You know it? What am I crazy about? You're crazy about them grandbabies. I mean, a little old grandbaby can walk up through here. You watch the grandparents. They'll watch every step, won't they? They will. Next Sunday, before church now, not during church. Well, in, during church, if the kids get up and leave, every grandparent in the building will watch them until the door closes. I don't blame you. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. You look at this couple right here. Y'all know them? Jan and Sammy. Lily comes across this aisle bopping. And they're just about falling out of their seat. I'm going to start taking pictures of them. Huh? Why? They don't only love that kid. They cherish that kid. She is... Their life, you could say, in, in a lot of different ways. Right? Now, parents are pretty good too, but grand, there's nothing like the love of a grandparent. I want you to know that. So if we can love one another in a special way, how much more special should our love for the Lord Jesus Christ be? Hmm. He said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. You can't go to heaven unless you're born again. So forget your baptism if you wasn't saved. Forget all that you've done. All, I remember in, uh, in the denomination, people would get these little Sunday school pins. 
for every Sunday that they were there. And I mean, there were people come in at the association, look like Audie Murphy or had more medals on their chest than Audie Murphy. For you young people, Audie Murphy was, is the most, was the most declarated uh, veteran uh, of any war. And he was in World War II, Audie Murphy. So, what's the point? The point is, none of that matters if you're not born again. If you're not born again. Brother Gary, how do I be born again? First of all, you've got to be convicted of sin. Of sin. Don't just get up some Sunday and say, well, I'm going to go get saved today. It don't work that way. You have to be convicted of sin. Except God draw you, you won't be saved. Everybody would say amen. Except God draws you, you won't be saved. How am I going to be drawn? By listening to the word of God. By being around old time gospel singing, right? Old time spiritual sin. Now it could be a new song, but it needs to be sung in an old time way with the power of God saturating it, right? Right. And I tell you what, will it really help? If the saints of God every once in a while get so crazy in the spirit they can't help from shouting and standing up and maybe dancing a little bit. You dance with Lily. You dance with your granddaughter, your grandson. Get happy in the Lord every once in a while. How am I going to get happy? Well, you got to live it. you got to live salvation. Come to church praying that the Holy Ghost fall upon you. God, give me something to do Sunday morning. I don't teach Sunday school. I don't sing. I don't preach. I don't, I'm not an usher. I don't do this. But you got the Holy Spirit, and whatever he orders up will be just right. You've got to be born again. Then you walk in. Then listen. Then what do I do? You come to him believing that he is, that he's everything Brother Gary told you and a million other preachers. That he's everything the Bible says. And that he's your hope and he wants to be the centerpiece of your life. And he will be once you're born again. I'll stay with it. Number one question I get at funerals is how do people make it without Jesus Christ at a time such as this? I don't know. I hope I never know. Because I want to die in faith and go to heaven when this life is over. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Somebody need prayer, you come right on. Someone here needs salvation, please come. Please come as God deals with your soul.